Uh, hey everyone, my name's Lena. I'm based in Sydney, Australia, and I work in incident response at SecureWorks. Prior to working at SecureWorks, I was also doing incident response and threat hunting at Accenture. Uh, in my spare time, I do like to publish a lot of research, and I do so on Twitter and also on my blog, and my primary interests lie in APT attacks, mobile, and also cloud security. So today we're going to cover a few things. However, my overall goal of the presentation is to, I guess, really demonstrate the impact that Chinese political goals have on the style of attacks that are carried out by Chinese APT groups. And throughout the course of the last few years, the relationship between China and Australia has, you know, soured. And that has resulted in an incredible uptick in the amount of Chinese, alleged Chinese APT cases that we've seen and worked on at SecureWorks. So specifically throughout this presentation, I'm gonna to touch on four attacks that I worked on and show you how these goals or this, these attacks were linked to the overall goals of the Chinese Communist Party. And at the very end, I'm gonna talk a little, bit, a little bit about China's recruitment policies and thought curriculums. So full disclaimer, I am going to be saying allegedly a lot because threat intelligence is rarely ever 100% accurate. But on top of this, this presentation is not a reflection of my personal political views, nor is it a reflection of SecureWorks political views. So with that, let's get into it. In 2012, right after Xi Jinping became the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, he announced something called the Chinese Dream. And in Chinese, it's referred to as Zhonghua Minzu the Wei Da Fuxing, which roughly translates to the great rejuvenation or revitalization of China. And this particular dream had two goals. The first one is for China to become a well-off society or moderately wealthy by 2021, which I do believe they have achieved. And the second is for China to become a fully developed nation by 2049. Now from 2012 until today, these two pillars have been the underlying crux of the Xi Jinping administration. And on top of this, you know, all goals kind of dwindle without some kind of success measurement. And in this instance, it is China Oh, apologies, it is China becoming a world leading economy. And so as a part of this, China set up something called One Belt, One Road. And basically this strategy is to generate some kind of economic trade dominance. And uh, the TLDR for this is China is basically financing, leasing a set of ports and hubs all across Central Asia and through Europe. And the purpose of these ports and hubs is to facilitate trade and also maritime access. And, you know, the initiative has taken an immense amount of funding from the Chinese government. And the goals of this is to strengthen financial cooperation with each of these countries, strengthening the trade relations with these countries, and also to make renminbi the main trading investment currency. And I say renminbi as in the Chinese currency itself. Now, getting one belt and one road to be successful, it's not as simple as just, you know, purchasing and leasing a set of ports and hubs. There's also a series of strategies that kind of underpin the push for this one strategic movement. And one of this is a set of acquisitions. Of course, there are a lot of acquisitions, so I've had to just pick and choose, cherry pick. And this one was one that I found particularly interesting. And this acquisition was Citic Telecom purchasing Lynx Telecommunications. And the reason why this is interesting is because it gives China access to the underlying telecommunications infrastructure and services of 130 countries that coincidentally sit in this Belt and Road region. And I say that acquisitions are interesting because of something called the Chinese National Intelligence Law. This is a law that states that all Chinese businesses, subsidiaries, even located outside of China, and also all Chinese citizens are required by law to support, assist, and cooperate with matters of national intelligence. And by that, it means, you know, all these people need to use all the means, tactics, and channels that are available to them in order to carry out this work. We had an example in recent times of what, you know, failure or quote unquote failure may have looked like. 
And this happened during the log4j vulnerability, which I'm sure a lot of you would be familiar with. Uh, one of the security researchers at Alibaba Cloud found this vulnerability. However, they did not first disclose it to the Chinese government. And that has resulted in a series of punishing actions, you know, financially punishing actions, such as Chinese regulators suspending partnerships with Alibaba and severing contracts. Now, before I jump into the case study, I kind of want to touch on the diminishing relationship between China and Australia, because this directly links to these four cyber attacks that I'm going to cover. So I'm going to give a high level timeline of this now. So in 2012, Australia, you know, we were setting up our national broadband network and we banned Huawei from putting in bids. In 2018, we actually banned Huawei completely from constructing any of our critical infrastructure. That includes 5G. On top of banning it, we proceeded to urge the UK also not to take in bids from Huawei for 5G. In that same year, we actually passed a foreign interference law that made all industrial espionage illegal. In 2020, China actually published a dossier of 14 disputes or 14 grievances with Australia. So these are things that China's upset with Australia about. And in that list, it included things like the banning of Huawei and the blocking of several Chinese investments in Australia. So from 2020 until 2021, more things happened. In 2020, Australia pushed an inquisition into the coronavirus outbreak. You can imagine that wasn't received very well. In 2021, Australia blocked China from investing in any of our critical sectors like infrastructure, tech and, you know, energy. In 2021, Australian government then made a series of very public criticisms of what China was doing in Xinjiang with the Uyghur Muslims, in Taiwan and also in Hong Kong. Now, the nature of the China-Australian relationship is very interesting because historically China has relied very heavily on Australia as we export iron ore to China and we also export gas, oil and you know coal. So this is the mining and the energy sector. Following the tensions that happened in 2021, China released a five-year plan to end their dependency on Australia for iron ore completely. This will have severe economic repercussions for Australia because China is actually 36.5% of all of our gross export shares. It will hurt the Australian economy. And China's strategy to do so includes importing iron ore from Brazil and also building an iron ore mine in the West African mountain regions that spans 110 kilometers. Now, Bronze Mohawk is a threat group that SecureWorks actively tracks. And this group you may have seen referred to by other vendors such as APT40 or maybe Leviathan. And the reason I'm pulling this out is because this particular threat group we have actually seen being incredibly active during the 2021 uh, year. In 2020, the Australian government actually released a very interesting paper and it was called the Copy Paste Report. And this report was, went on for 62 pages, and it said that a nation state was targeting Australian organisations. It did not state what country this nation state is, but I will leave the inference up to you. It covered like a set of TTPs that this nation state was using, including breaching companies through Telerik, SharePoint, Mobile Iron, the use of LDIF-DE tool, abuse of legacy Microsoft 365, and the use of DLL search order hijacking to install Cobalt Strike. Coincidentally, we have seen every single one of these in cases that we've worked from 2020 to 2021. And I will go into this in a little bit. In 2021, right after the Chinese government released that they had developed a plan to end their dependency on Australia's mining sector for iron ore, one of our clients in the mining sector experienced an alleged bronze mohawk attack. The attack started with web scanning, which is, you know, very typical for a large organization. This web scanning wasn't too aggressive. It actually blended in with the usual web traffic. But one thing that did stand out was the use of nuclei. And I say nuclei is interesting because this then became a recurring theme throughout every single one of the Bronze Mohawk engagements we worked on. Uh, they used Nuclei to perform external scanning, and through that they found that this client 
you know, was running a contractor portal, which is very normal for infrastructure based clients. So then they found this portal and they enumerated it and discovered it had a series of SQL injection vulnerabilities. Naturally, the attackers exploited that and proceeded to use this, you know, SQL injection to start to attempt to download security and system event logs. This is very interesting because gathering the security and system event logs would allow this threat actor to, you know, enumerate the types of logins that happen, services that run, and also schedule tasks that run. A lot of interesting information. Through SQL, the attackers then proceeded to install a JSP web shell, which I've got you know, a screenshot of the actual web shell. And this allowed the attackers remote code execution onto the server, which they then proceeded to run a series of commands using LDIFDE, which I said was mentioned in the Australian copy paste report. This is a Microsoft owned tool that allows enumeration of forests and domains. I've also got a series of other commands that they ran that I've got in the super timeline, uh, you know, just usual credential enumeration. And then in pink, I've highlighted the command that they ran to perform credential dumping. Now, we kept recurringly see uh, these alleged bronze mohawk attacks use this method for credential dumping, and we did not see evidence of Mimikatz being utilized. The end goal of the attack was for file access and file enumeration. And it was very clear that this was the end goal because the attackers started to enumerate several documents pertaining to mining and other you know, documents like that. And it was interesting because the attackers also logged into three specific mailboxes and they did this through leveraging legacy authentication in Microsoft 365, which once again was referenced in the Australian copy paste report. On top of this, the attackers also had an awareness of several employees within the business, like very in detail knowledge of these people's existence. And our hypothesis is it's probably gleaned from LinkedIn, but of course that's difficult to prove. And at the very end of the investigation, we had collected around 30 different IPs that the threat actors used. Literally right after this case finished, we got another case. It kind of even overlapped. Uh, this case was the energy sector, big surprise. And this particular client had received a high confidence alert from a trusted third party. And I do say trusted because it was a trusted third party that alleged bronze mohawk IPs were interacting with their environment. So we were called in to perform incident response on this instance. And the second we kind of jumped in, we had you know, found a series of other IPs, but these IPs were all geolocated in Australia. But more interestingly, they were instances of compromised microtech routers that the attackers were using to proxy the attack in. Once again, similar TTPs started to emerge, uh, apologies, including the use of Nuclei, Python, and other open source tools. And it was really interesting because after using Nuclei, the threat actors once again zoned in on a contractor portal, which they then found a vulnerability for that they then, you know, exploited. That allowed them access to that server and they proceeded to log in using decommissioned third party credentials. They created malicious user credentials and then they proceeded to enumerate documents, hundreds of documents pertaining to this client. And they even attempted to try and exploit SharePoint, which was interesting because they made a series of remote procedural calls to do so. And interestingly enough, one of the IPs that we witnessed in this particular incident, we had already seen prior that year on one of another, another one of our clients that we worked on that experienced an alleged bronze mohawk attack. During the investigation, uh, the clients also seemed like they had some kind of a playbook that they were trying to run. And what I mean by that is they were looking for instances of mobile iron running. They were looking for instances of Telerik running. Now, if you remember when I was talking about the copy paste report, the Australian government actually outlined a series of technologies that the client was, uh, not the client, the threat actors were targeting. And prior to them actually breaching this organization, we saw a lot of instances of them, you know, looking for Telerik and looking for mobile iron. Now, what's interesting with this case, with the mining sector and also with the energy sector, Firstly, I would say is the fact that, you know, there was a big shift in sophistication from what was done for initial reconnaissance through to, you know, uh, 
initial exploitation, it was less sophisticated. And then when they actually landed on the server, the types of enumeration and defense evasion techniques they used became more sophisticated. And it's actually been hypothesized by several security researchers that perhaps China has a tier one that operates across various APT groups and then hands over to you know, another tier. And I say this because there was a stark contrast in technical skill. Xi Jinping's dream of China is one where China's military power is, you know, second to none. And what that means is the ability to deter the US specifically if conflict is required. And currently, the People's Liberation Army has the largest naval force in the world. They also have hypersonic missiles, which travel five times faster than the speed of sound. And they are the second largest military spender in the world, right after the US. China also has an air force with advanced equipment, allegedly stolen from US designs. Now, back in 2017, a defense contractor in Australia that was focused on aerospace engineering experienced an incident. And this incident resulted in the exfiltration of 30 gigabytes of sensitive data that was under restricted access. The data included information pertaining to the US F-35 stealth fighter, which was actually recently featured in the news, I think a few days ago. And this was all stolen through the China Chopper web shell, which is a notorious web shell that Chinese APT groups have used throughout the years. And I think like notorious because it actually even emerged in 2021 with the exchange breach and, you know, then the attackers then subsequently installing China, China Chopper. And here you can see the uncanny resemblance between the Chinese Chengdu J-20 aircraft and the American F-35. And actually, a few weeks ago, this article was released that China was potentially, you know, going to release a stealth helicopter that resembles the US Black Hawk. But, you know, this is conjecture at this point in time, you know, it's alleged. No actual images have surfaced, but it'll be interesting to keep an eye out on that. As a part of, you know, China having a very strong naval base, they're very focused on naval technology. And in 2018, there was a Chinese businessman that was allegedly tasked by the Chinese Northwestern Polytechnical University to export US hydrophones to Chinese state owned businesses and hydrophones are devices that allow underwater sound monitoring so you can understand why this would be important to the naval base he was found guilty of supplying up to 60 hydrophones worth 100k but he was you know allegedly it was alleged that he stole over 8 million and so as a part of this I guess, thirst for technology that brings me to the third initiative that Xi Jinping has set and this, this initiative is called Made in China 2025. The goal is for China to move from being a world producer of cheaper low-tech items to becoming a more technologically intensive manufacturer. And so the goals of this initiative include China ramping up their research and development spend, especially on tech, reducing tax rates on all the domestic tech companies, approving mergers and acquisitions with foreign tech companies, and focusing on areas like cybersecurity, robotics, fintech, you know, uh, biotechnology, quantum computing. The goal is for China to become a technological powerhouse. And by that, China sees the importance of self-sufficiency. And what I mean by self-sufficiency is not needing to rely on the supply chain from other countries. They want to be able to control the supply chain all domestically. And that kind of brings me to my next point. So China is actually outpacing the rest of the world in 5G because of, you know, Huawei and also electrical vehicle adoption. Both rely on the use of semiconductors and semiconductors are I mean, has been referred to as the crown jewels of tech because it's a critical enabler for new technologies. For example, quantum computing, uh, you know, fintech space, et cetera. And what's interesting is leadership in the semiconductor industry would actually allow, will help China geopolitically because currently Taiwan and the US dominate the supply chain for semiconductors. And semiconductors. I'll just note are also critical in military, uh, has military advantages because it's used in national security systems. 
As a part of this, China has actually exempted all domestic semiconductor companies from tax for 10 years. And China has also you know, raised billions of dollars in their national semiconductor fund. The reason why they're focusing on semiconductor links back to Made in China 2025, where they want to be technologically self-sufficient. And if the supply chain is stopped or disrupted by Taiwan or, you know, US, that greatly hamstrings China's ability to evolve in the tech space. In 2021, I worked a case where this client was a big tech company. They were one of the, uh, I guess, world pioneers of this technology in their respective sector. And during this time, a lot of interesting things happened. The dwell time that we witnessed was around four months. On top of this, the threat actors started to use DLL search order hijacking to install Cobalt Strike in enterprise application directories. The threat actors also performed credential dumping through manually dumping out LSAS, which you know, I've already referenced twice in the previous two cases. The threat actors were focused on exfiltration, and that seemed to be the goal. Uh, they were iterating through file servers and share drives globally through this company, looking for documents pertaining to research and development, innovation, patents, technology. You know, you get the gist of the, st the style that, of files that they were looking for. And once the client realized that the threat actors were in their environment, you know, most clients tend to kind of react very quickly and start to shut down servers, etc. But that alerted the threat actors and resulted in a series of punishing activities like the threat actors started to lock people out of their accounts by changing credentials. And the threat actors also started to enable hundreds of disabled user accounts. Now, as per the copy paste report, we did see DLL search order hijacking used to install Cobalt Strike. Uh, is my screen loading? Or is it just me that it's looking kind of glitched? Uh, no, it anyway. looks glitchy. Okay, so let me go back. Is that better? Yeah, it looks better now. See that. Okay, perfect. So as per the copy paste report, we saw DLL search order hijacking used to install Cobalt Strike. I've redacted this a bit so uh, I'm just going to verbally talk you through it. Basically, what happened was the attackers used remote WMI to execute Cobalt Strike, and they installed it in, you know, application directories that were specific to the organization. And then on top of this, they started to execute the DLL through msbuild.exe and proceeded to run the DLL in memory. So now, once Cobalt Strike is running in memory, the threat actors then removed the DLL. And that obviously was a form of defense evasion. And this technique was referenced in the Australian copy paste report. In the same year, I actually worked another case where one of our nursing home clients were also experiencing an alleged bronze mohawk attack. Now this client actually received an alert from a trusted third party. And once we jumped in to do the IR, we had found around five IPs pertaining to alleged bronze mohawk. And what happened was the attackers were using nuclei to perform enumeration of the external perimeter. Then the attackers realized, you know, once they started like going through Telerik, Mobile Iron, this client was unfortunately running Mobile Iron. So they zoned in on the Mobile Iron server, exploited the vulnerability, and used that to install JSP web shells. And I've got a screenshot of the web shell there. And they installed several JSP web shells by injecting it to the start of legitimate web pages. They then proceeded to enumerate credentials. They iterated through the web logs, looking for lines in the logs that showed the attack IP. They proceeded to delete those logs and then installed Tsunami Bot. Now, at this point, if you think that this is strange, I'm with you. It does seem strange, but we'll talk about that in a second. So I've got a screenshot here of the command they used to run the JSP web shell and the command that they used to remotely install Tsunami Bot from a remote server. And so I say this is interesting because back to the energy case where the client was running, you know, uh, had IPs attacking them from compromised microtech routers, we hypothesized that this attack was likely for the purpose of infrastructure building. Now, in order for China to become a world economic leader, it needs to rely on the youth. And that is where this comes in. As of 2021, China is bringing something into the school curriculum from primary through to university called Xi Jinping thought. 
And this is a thought curriculum that teaches the youth. <laughs> it's strange using the word youth, it makes me feel old, but it's to teach the youth the importance of nationalistic pride and to also instill in them this sense of national responsibility and a call to arms for these kids to innovate. Coincidentally, this aligns with China's goals of becoming you know, a technological superpower. And so you can see that the role of education is critical in the achievement of the Chinese dream, because in 2021, Georgetown CSET division actually published a brilliant report. And this report highlighted the, like, the link between state-funded Chinese universities, six of them, and how they were linked to six APT groups. The first one on the list, Hainan University, you can see there, is linked to APT40, aka Bronze Mohawk. I've also got screenshots of various professors from these universities. In particular, Professor Gu Jian from Hainan University was said that he would post a lot of job listings on student boards and host hacking competitions and specifically look for students to quote, solve problems. And these problems were also always referring to some kind of hacking problem or a technical issue, but he would offer prize money of up to 74,000 USD, which is an incredible amount of money to just be throwing around at problems. But as a part of China's science of strategy, uh, China's science of military strategy, Universities are actually a key vessel in how China maintains their cybersecurity influence. The university's role is to foster, foster you know, cyber talent, develop new tactics and methods that can then be leveraged in the future in cyber attacks. And this kind of shortens the length of time needed to turn academic research into operational cyber capabilities. Now, you'll also see in this list that all six of these universities partake in creating courses, cybersecurity courses that align with AI and machine learning. China is heavily investing in AI and machine learning pertaining to the research in cyberspace. Now, in terms of takeaways for my presentation, the first one I want to highlight is the impact that presidential terms and checks and balances has. What I mean by that is, in Western politics like Australia and US, in Australia, the prime minister only has a term for four years. China is in a very unique position where Xi Jinping isn't held back by that. And that enables him to think about the strategies for China 20 to 30 years in the future. Hence why made in China, or sorry, hence why the Chinese dream was created in 2012 and has spanned the entire length of his term up to date. The second point is that China moves very fast and has an incredible agility in politics. And that has led to a rapid, you know, a rapid growth in their technological sector. And a part of that is the lack of checks and balances. So Xi Jinping's able to instill policies. And in Western politics, that wouldn't be the case because there's opposing parties that would question those policies and debate them. As a part of this, that links into my second point. Because of this rapid technological growth, China's cyber capability is only elementary compared to what it can be. And I say this because, you know, China is heavily investing in these areas, as you've seen. It's a part of their overall geopolitical strategy. The third point is that threat intelligence, especially when it comes to nation state threat groups, is very linked to the geopolitical goals from that country and also the geopolitical relationships between each country. And I hope that through this presentation, you're able to see some of the linkages that I was, you know, subtly trying to push uh, between what was happening in the decline of the Australian and Chinese relationship to some of the cyber attacks that I've referenced. The last point I want to raise is the importance of being more proactive versus reactive. You know, in the past, a lot of you know, incident response people kind of respond or only talk about what's happening after an attack happens. Given that we know that China has a specific policy that links universities to these cybersecurity groups and has a specific program for them to generate research in machine learning and the applications of that in cybersecurity, I think it would be very wise for you know, us to pay attention to some of the research being funded and pushed out because it'll only be a matter of time before the research makes the jump from theory into practice. And with that, thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate your time and you can always stay in touch with me on Twitter.